Amen. So now, like last uh, two weeks ago, because last uh, week I'm not around, two weeks ago we I preached about uh, in First Corinthians chapter number seven, and I preached about the danger of um, like a husband and wife. You know, sometimes um, they don't they don't know what to do. So like I said, it seems like the message that I preached last time, I mean last uh, two weeks ago, is like a like a marriage counseling, right? And um, yeah, so we have to be very, very careful because if we are not careful enough, that the devil, our enemy, will uh, took advantage of that, and and that is uh, sometimes the cause of many. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, husband and wife separated; they are going to divorce or even an annulment. That's the problem. Okay, but now we are going to go deeper than that. Okay, in our lesson, so we come to divorce among believers. So this is the lesson that we're going to have divorce among believers so divorce is never be the best option you know in the philippines there's no divorce but i think there is an annulment okay but in singapore there is a divorce so, so again but like i said divorce is never be the best option but divorce is sometimes we come to the point like that's the only option you know for the marriage uh, marriage man and woman the teaching here is simply uh, simple and plain first all measures are to be employed to keep a husband and wife together okay and the ideal end to any marital dispute is reconciliation again if there is a problem within husband and wife the best way that we could do is always think about reconciliation it's not like sometimes when we fight i mean uh, husband and wife when they fight they are started to you know okay let's divorce uh, let's separate uh, daring you know to be separated and then in the end they regret you know they started to go they, they divorced me oh you're the one who asked for it you know and then now you started to cry and being feel uh, so pity on yourself you see so again paul was careful here to state this you no know, was a command of the lord not his own opinion in our text uh, this is dealing with saved church members and the lord has an interest in their action here, the way believers behave, okay, has a direct effect on their testimony for the Lord. And uh, this is why believers in Christ should go to the extra mile to work out any differences they may have on any level. Amen? I say work out, okay, and take an extra mile. You know, say, you know, you know Pastor, I've been doing this for some time, you know, like nothing there is no uh, progress well in the first place you make that decision long before amen so yeah in this chapter well, which might be overlooked by the casual reader you will notice in verse number six in this chapter paul said but i speak by this by permission and not of commandment that's what he said you know in, in verse number six and then in verse number eight, Apostle Paul said here, um, I say therefore, so he say, I say therefore. But in verse number 10, Paul said, yet not I. So I say therefore, and then in verse number he say, yet not I, but the Lord. And then in verse number 12, he said, to the rest, I speak I, not the Lord. So again, in verse 25, he said, I have not commanded a command, a commandment, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment. Finally, in verse 40, he said, I think also that I have, I have the Spirit of God. Here, Paul is not uh, disclaiming inspiration. Okay? In this text, he's not disclaiming inspiration. What we are looking at here is that he is referring to what Jesus taught during his earthly ministry. So there is no contradiction here because there are some people think that, oh, this is a contradiction, you see? Paul said he, it is his own word, and then now he become inspired by God or something like that. So like I said, he is repairing to what Jesus taught you know, during his earthly ministry. So there were some times that Jesus never discussed. So therefore, Paul is giving instruction in this matter. So this commandment, or the commandment of the Lord in verse number 10, verses 10 and 11, he say, and unto the married I command yet not I but the Lord. So, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from, the, from her husband, but, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried and let not the husband put away his wife so again 
uh, it also read that in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 32. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of, for, for, of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committed adultery. And in Matthew chapter uh, 19, verses 6 to 9, the Bible said, Wherefore, they are no more twain. Of course, this is in response of the Lord when uh, the, the, the Pharisees asked him this question. He say, Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? So it seems like they are so uh, uh, genius, huh? they are so wise. He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, look at that, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning, the Bible said, it was not so. It was not so. And I say unto you, whatsoever shall put away his wife, except it be fornication, and shall marry another, committed adultery, and whoso marrieth her, which is put away, that commit adultery. So this is the lesson that we're going to um, learn this morning. So number one, Roman numeral number one, the command for marriage, married believers. What about those believers? No, this is the question. Who were married to another believer? The problem here is this. Because at the Church of Corinth, you know, they are unbelievers, full of Gentiles, and then they live in a wicked life. And then it happened that they become saved. And one partner got saved, and the other partner is not saved. So they were thinking about it. So now I'm saved. So what now? Should I uh, divorce my wife because I got saved? Or should I divorce my husband because now I am got saved? So that is the point. That is the question. So here, there are times, like as however, that this might be necessary. I mean, like you say, like, like the Bible said, let not the wife depart from her husband. So this is the instruction given to them by the Apostle Paul. When they ask, should I divorce my partner? You see, it, so Paul commands the husband to not send away or divorce his wife. He also commands that the wife is not to depart or separate from her husband. Now, there are times, however, that this might be necessary, especially when the husband is unfaithful or abusive, okay, toward the wife or children, of course. So, Paul makes it very clear here that he say, if, if there is to be a separation or divorce, like say, like there is no other option, that's the, op the only option. So, which means, if you're going to do this, there are two options for the couple when you're going for divorce. I mean, if you have this problem, number one is remain unmarried. If you want to divorce, you have to remain unmarried. You know? And then reconcile to your spouse. You know, be reconciled to your spouse. So when husband and wives disagree, they should pray about their disagreement, not fight. Amen? Husband and wife, don't fight. Seek the will of the Lord for I mean, to the lives of their individuals, or individual lives. Now, this will go a long way toward resolving differences. Remember, don't expect that your wife behave like you. Then if you think that your wife behave like you, then you are looking for a man, not a wife. Right? The problem is we, we have too much expectation, and then, you know, we must understand that the weakness of I and mean, then their weakness for our partner and we must feel that weakness you see of course likewise for the wife don't don't think and you know like the same way don't uh, i mean expect that your husband behave like you you know imagine if your husband behave like you you're in trouble i tell you <laughs> you're in big trouble hmm? so again like I said, this is a long way you know, toward resolving differences. So, but there are situations, like I said, where the differences simply cannot be resolved. So then, divorce may be, I say maybe, the only option or solution. Again, if a wife departs her husband, okay, she is not to do so merely to marry someone else. She is either to remain unmarried or to be reconciled to her husband. That is the instruction and command. 
You see, the last phrase suggests that the same kind of behavior is expected in a husband. The wording reflects the attitude of that ancient society. Here the wife would depart or leave her husband. She would simply walk away from the marriage without any legal standing to do so. So in contrast, the husband could put away his wife so he could legally declare the marriage void. So here, but neither of that, uh, this action was best. Okay? Ideally, both husband and wife were to be reconciled in the Lord. That's why I remember one time there is uh, this lady who came to me, of course, with my wife, and she asked for advice. I say, what happened? Oh, you know, my husband uh, beaten me, and um, please tell me, Pastor, what should I do? I say, oh, what you should do? Okay. You want to reconcile, you want to fix this problem? He said, yes, Pastor, I want to fix this problem. And I told her, you know, sister, the way I look at it is you're not living the right way. I mean, what you said, you must get right before God first, sister. And he was, she was shocked. And I said, you must uh, not only get right before God, but also you must be reconciled to the church. I'm not repairing that when you're reconciled to the church, which means you become faithful workers or serve the Lord. Which means you're right, you have a right relationship with the Lord and church. Because in that way, if you have a right relationship with the Lord and church, you know, evidently, your heart is right and you know what to do. But, of course, she expected me that I will tell her or instruct her that, never mind, now, you just divorce your husband. But that is not the advice that she received from us. And she was so upset. And that caused her to leave the church. Imagine. Anyway, if you come to me and think that I will answer according to what you think, you may be surprised. Amen? Not all the time. We have the same understanding. And all the time, I always wanted that the people, maybe those brethren who come to me and seek advice, I want them to read the Bible and let the word of God speak to you, not me. Amen? So again, Although divorce is sometimes necessary, again, and there are scriptural grounds for divorce. I say there is a scriptural ground. Later, we're going to understand that. It is a strategy for all involved. Or is a tragedy, not a strategy. It's a tragedy. <laughs> strategy is different, right? It's a tragedy, you know? It's a tragedy for all involved. So which means, like I always said, if divorce happened, you know, tragedy with the wife, with the husband, and worse if they have kids. You know, the kids suffer. So, that's the command. The command is, if you have problem, reconcile or remain unmarried. Very simple. Number two, the counsel for mixed marriage. This time, there's a counsel for mixed marriage. Because for the husband and wife who are both believers, like I said, it is easy to, you know, to settle their matters. I, I repeat, if they are genuinely Christian, it is easy to resolve their issues because every time you presented them the word of God, they cannot contend. You know, they will just easily obey and follow the word of God. But when we deal with unbelievers, I tell you, you are in big, 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 big trouble. That's why those single, this is served as a warning to you. Amen? Not only for the ladies, but even for the men. Amen? Uh, don't say, oh, why, bro Pastor, brother so-and-so married for the unbeliever, and now they're both serving the Lord. Why, sister so-and-so, he, he, she married to an unbeliever, and now they're both serving the Lord. Well, it might be uh, applicable to them, but that is not a rule. Are you with me? That's not a rule. And you, might, you may never know. And this brother or this sister is still struggling because of the foolishness of our thinking we follow the flesh you see so let's take a look about the council for mixed marriages there were folks like i said in the church that were married to unbelievers so they trusted christ as their savior after they had been married so this would put a strain on some marriages because the christian spouse would no longer indulge in the vices of sin so Many times, this would upset the unbelieving spouse because he or she is no longer had anything in common with the spouse. Because that person is a new creature. 
So let me say straight, no, let me say this one. Now, why Christian is not to date, okay? Or Christian is not to date or marry an unsaved person. If you do, you begin the marriage with two strikes against you. Here, when the Lord is left out of the lives of married couple, the marriage is weakened and has a tendency to fall completely apart. So here, if you will just do what God say, okay, you follow and obey what God say, you no, know, everything, you no, know, it will save you a whole bunch of heartache and bunch of money that you will have to spend in divorce courts and alimony. Imagine those uh, judges, you know, uh, those judge and those uh, lawyers, they are just gaining money from you. Come on, come on, money, money, money. Okay. Oh, you want to divorce? Okay, let's settle down. Let's make a divorce. Yeah. They don't think, if, they don't even consider to reconcile your problem. And even uh, those so-called um, marriage counselor, they gaining money, you know. We spend a lot of money. So the question facing the Corinthian was, what is no, a person to do when they get saved after they have been married? So should they leave their has uh, unsaved spouse? Apostle Paul answered this question in verses 12 to 16 in our text. Take note, there is also a reminder for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 14 or chapter 6, verses 14 to 17. He said, But ye not be ye not unequally yoked together with the unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? The answer is very obvious. The answer is none, nothing. And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? You know? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? These are the rhetoric questions by the Apostle Paul. For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. The Bible said, be ye separate. That's why we believe in scriptural separation. Amen? Be ye separate. Say the Lord and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Paul deals with situation of unbelieving spouse and offers his own advice here. He tells this uh, Christian man that if they have a wife that is not saved and if that wife is willing to remain married to them, then don't divorce or don't divorce her. Don't break up the marriage. If Christian wife had an unsaved husband and he was willing to continue to be her husband, then she should not leave or divorce or divorce him. So he explained why they should remain their uh, spouse. You know, in, in verse 14, notice, uh, uh, turn with me in, in, in verse 14. He say again, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, the Bible said, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband elsewhere, your children unclean, but now they are holy. So what does this mean? What does this mean? Paul was saying the marriage is to keep intact because the godly influence of the Christian in the home might be use of God to win the lost spouse and their children. So that's why if you are a believer and your family members are unbeliever, then you will going to be the light of the world. I mean the light of them. They will see in your life that you are saved and you might win them to Christ. And that's what, notice with me in verse number 16. He say, For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt thou shall save thy husband, or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Apostle Paul continues his counsel and tells the Christian wives and husband what to do if their spouses wanted to dissolve the marriage with a divorce. Notice in verse number 15, he say, But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God hath called us to peace, the Bible said. So this verse has been a great source of confusion, actually. It's a great source of confusion, and it is what I call a battleground verse. They call it, I mean, battleground verse. Because, you know, if the unsaved spouse, okay, take note of this. If the unsaved spouse demands a divorce, the believer is not under bondage or enslaved. To preserve the marriage union and even to contest that divorce or engage in legal maneuver 
they are to let the spouse go. Likewise, when this ladies came, lady came to us, this woman came to us, and she wanted to divorce the husband, I realized that this woman wanted to remarry. Anyway, sometimes they come to you with uh, some, you know, they tell you different stories, but God is faithful to reveal the truth, you know. So again, it is assumed then that remarriage is okay in this text. It seems like the remarriage is okay. Yet nothing is said about remarriage because the person is still bound to God's law. You see, nothing is said about a second marriage for the deserted spouse. Never allow a questionable or obscure interpretation of Scripture to contradict the clear and positive teaching of the Scripture. You see, freedom from unbeliever is not freedom to remarry. Are you with me? So if you are trying, maybe you are at some point, someone will come to you and ask for your, uh, what is uh, the right thing to do? And this will going to help you. I'm not uh, preaching this because there are some problems in our marriage life in the church. But if you are going through, then this is a right message for you. But if you're not going through, it's still a right message because it prepares us maybe to help someone. Amen? And even, of course, for those single ladies and men here that you know what to do. Okay? Like I said, this would totally contradict a number of scriptures in the Bible. Paul has uh, I mean, already made it clear in this chapter that either remain single or reconcile the marriage. So even if the, that marriage was to a lost person, if remarriage was okay, then he would be contradicting what he just said. We say only that breaks the marriage bond in God's eyes. You know? So notice some other principle here. Principles, no? The Bible that discourages remarriage to someone else. <clears throat> First is death breaks the marriage bond. Only death. But don't plot to kill, okay? <laughs> oh, that's the only way. Okay, I know. I know what to do. <laughs> no? <laughs> like the Bible said in chapter 7 of the book of Romans, verses 2 and 3, for the woman which had an husband is bound by the law. I don't know, no? There is a slashing a few days ago, right? And the guy, yeah, he tried to attack the wife, no? And tried to... I mean, I think he's determined to kill his wife, and you know, in in broad daylight. But anyway, I don't know if he knew this one, but like the Bible said, for the woman which had an husband is bound by the law to her husband. Take note, so long as he lived, so it means as long as that man is alive, then she is bound. But if the husband dead, okay, take note of that. She is loose from the law of her husband, so which means she's free. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an, what? Adulteress, though she be married to another man. You see? And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 39, the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is liberty to be married to whom? She will only in. Oh, there is the word there. Liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. You see, only in the Lord. And then, that is a death breaks the marriage bond. Then next is divorce and remarriage is called adultery. In Mark chapter 10, verses 11 to 12. The Bible said, And he saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife, and marry another, committed adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband, and be married to another, she committed adultery. Likewise, in Luke chapter 16, in verse 18, Whosoever put away his wife, and married another, committed adultery. And whosoever married her, that is put away from her husband, committed adultery. Some may ask, Are there any exceptions? Sometimes they are looking for, uh, maybe there is a, a little bit uh, loophole uh, on that uh, command. Then, yes, they are found only in the book of Matthew. Oh, 
Kenna. <laughs> but not the other gospel. So it's found in Matthew, but not in the other gospel. The reason these exceptions are found in the Matthew is because, take note, like I said, the audience, you know, the audience, the book of Matthew, the audience are the Jews, Bible school student, right? The Jews, of course. And of course, like we know, all those are like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they represented Jesus Christ differently. For example, in the book of Matthew, Jesus Christ is king. In Luke, he's a perfect man. In, uh, in Mark, he's a servant. In the gospel, John is a, a deity of Christ. You see? That's the way how they presented. So it means now, in the book of Matthew, his audience are the Jews. Okay? So here, Matthew, because of because uh, it is, uh, I mean, there is a reason why uh, it talks about a divorce in the book of Matthew. Because this gospel, again, like I said, it's written to a Jewish audience, while the other gospel had both Jews or Jewish and Gentile audience. There, take note of this in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 32. Let's dissect this. But I say unto you, say, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving, look at the word that, saving for the cause of fornication. Hmm, seems like there is a reason, huh? They say, cause that her not commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her, that divorce commit adultery. And then in verse 9, uh, chapter 19 of Matthew, and I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be fornication. Whoa, you know, when I try to read those commentaries, say, oh, this is the verse that you can remarry. Except for fornication, which means if it's fornication, then I can divorce my wife and I am free to marry it again. Because except it be for fornication, the Bible said, wow. And you know what? Like I say, oh, I need to dig on this topic, on this subject. I need to study more. Well, take note of this. The word fornication that's being used here is the Greek word porneia. Okay, porneia. In this, this Jewish context, the word referred to three things. There are three things that referred in this porneia. The only, uh, that only the Jewish people would understand when use this word porneia. That's why, like I said, it is only found in the book of Matthew. Gentiles would not understand this application. Now, take note for this. Number one, the reason of this fornication. He say it could refer to the unfaithfulness. It could refer to the unfaithfulness betrothal uh, during the betrothal period. Most of the time, this the betrothal period is like it, it takes at least one year. But basically, this husband and wife, when they are exchanging the dowry, they are already husband and wife. And this is exactly what happened when Joseph found out that Mary conceived and Joseph wanted to divorce Mary but of course uh, the angel appeared and said no don't do that and that is in the period of betrothal and you see if if one of them if one of them commit fornication either the husband or the wife then they will apply this verse and they are free to get married but take note, this betrothal is like they will not consummate their marriage first. But basically, they are already husband and wife. So this is the point when Jesus Christ used this porneia. And the second reason, okay, the second reason is porneia could also refer to the incestuous marriage. You can read that in Leviticus chapter number 18. Like for example, like how many generation, third generation, if it is still in the third generation, and you, you don't know that, oh, this is my... Uh, third cousin and then you become husband and wife actually god will not let these things happen i mean he will not honor that kind of marriage and he say you have to divorce and then the third one is this pornea could also refer to the sodomite which means like those who marry like men and men and woman and woman and that is not um ac accepted marriage that is illegal and God will not allow that. And God will not honor that kind of marriage, the porneia, for incestus, and even for this sodomite or homosexual marriage. So in that way, that is only applicable. And of course, the Jewish tradition, the Jewish people understood when Jesus Christ said, except for fornication. So it means many marriages today, they wanted to divorce and use this text 
they took this text as out of context. Are you with me? Out of context. So, some may say, what about adultery? If the word fornication was to refer to adultery, then Paul would not have used the word porneia. He would have used the word moiteia, which means adultery. You see? So godly influence upon the unsaved party may lead them to salvation. So we have the a divine guide, we have divine guidance. If a man had an unbelieving wife, he was not obligated to put her away. The same rule applied to a believing woman with an unbelieving husband. So the word uh, there would be no purpose served in divorce in such situation. Think about it. The ideal is that the believing spouse would lead the unbelievers to Christ. Amen? We are told of the power of silent testimony in such situation. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 1. Say, likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husband. You know what? When, when the Bible said, be in subjection to your husband, it, this be, wife being subject, I mean, in, in subjection to the husband, it not speak about the weakness of the wife. Some, some wife think that, no, because I'm a strong personality, I can't, I can't do that. Well, actually, the truth is you are not. The Bible said, likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husband. Why? That if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. The conversation is like your, your li the, life, the lifestyle, the manner of your lifestyle. You see, this is a clear instruction from the Bible. It's not something that we are going to take this, I mean, are taking advantage, um, advantage for the man. You see, this verse suggests the godly behavior of a saved woman will have a power, powerful effect on an unbelieving husband. Imagine, sometimes you say, you know, Pastor, I'm, I, you know, I'm a Christian already, so should I, should I uh, subject to the authority of my husband even if he is not a saved person? Well, the Bible said, it never said whether it is uh, saved or unsaved. If it is your husband, then you have to subject. And if that husband find out that you are, you know, your, your life testimony, you might win that husband to the Lord. And that's the purpose. And don't be proud. Don't be proud. You might draw that husband away from the Lord or believing the Lord as his Savior. You see, in addition, there are children to consider as well. The behavior of the believer in such cases will greatly influence the children in the family. Their future salvation might depend on the witness of the saved mother or saved father. If the couple divorced, then this opportunity would be lost. Gone. Before a family is broken up in such cases, all possibilities should be considered. Amen? So two important points are made in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 15 to 16. One is that we are called to live in peace. That is what we are called, to live in peace. This includes our, uh, this include peace in our churches and peace in our families. We should seek peace and not uh, deliver uh, ultimatums that will only lead to strife. You see, in the church, sometimes we are so proud. And then in the house, we are so proud. So what happened? Everything, division in the house, division in the church, gone. And what kind of testimony are we showing to people? That's why I said, Christian, brethren, if you are a member of Asian Grace Baptist Church, I warn you, especially posting those uh, unnecessary things on your social media. Okay? If you have a problem with the church, deal in the church, within the church. If you have a problem with your family or maybe something on in personal things or maybe about Christian, don't go into social media and attack other Christian. What kind of testimony are we showing here? We are drawing away the people. Those unbelievers say, oh, these Christians, they are fighting each other, so why should I believe them? I live better than them. 
You see? Even if you have problems, sometimes, oh, feeling sad, feeling lonely. Oh. No, Pastor, it's just a story. You know, a story is only one day. Is it one day? Huh? One day or is there a certain time? 24 hours. Oh, I just put that in a story. No, nobody knows it. No, don't. <laughs> Live in peace, my beloved brethren. So if we have problem, you know, we already have given an, I mean, a proper way how to solve our issues, right? If you are the one who is being offended, go and tell him alone, the Bible said. Amen? Not go and tell to someone else. And of course, they, they are so good, you know, they are so good to find out, to spot a, a person who has something on with that person as well. And then they become allied. <laughs> And that's the division start. I mean, the beginning of division. So we should seek peace and not deliver ultimatums that will only lead to strife. Amen. Then the other point is that we do not know the future and we do not know how God may be working in our lives. So a situation that seems intolerable today may turn out to be the great blessing tomorrow. Amen. So the lost spouse can be saved and that will change everything. So if your husband or if your wife, your partner is unsaved, then you let the Lord use you as an instrument to win that partner into Christ. Yeah. Amen? Likewise, your children. Let's move on. Number three, the contentment of the believer. <clears throat> In verse 17, salvation does not permit you to undo your marital status. Okay? Because you are saved. Oh, now, uh, you know, Pastor, because last time we are not uh, saved yet. Eh? And then we got married. And now I've got saved. So maybe I, it's good that I can uh, divorce this wife. No? Because this wife <laughs> always talk. Every time, anywhere I go, you know, like, never stop. No, Never stop talking. <laughs> anyway. Love your wife. Amen? The Bible said, husband, you know, take note of this. In the book of Ephesians say, husband, love your wives. You know what does that mean? As Christ loved the church. Then, think about it, how Christ loved the church. Oh, the Bible said, Jesus Christ died for the church. So, Ryan, you have to die for Christine. Yeah? Dave died for Esther. That's the Bible said. Terence, you have to die for Shubana. That's the Bible said. That's the kind of love that is being mentioned in this book. We must ready to die for our wife. Mike. Etnes. Amen. <laughs> 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 Good work. Reduce purse. <laughs> Again, no, like I said, no, salvation does not permit you to undo your marital status. God calls some to be married and others to remain single. Okay? So we have quite a number of singles here. Huh? Next week, we're going to talk about it. Amen? <laughs> so that's part three of our lesson. <laughs> Be content with the marital status God has called you to until he leads you otherwise. Because there are some people say, you know, Pastor, you know, they come to me, Pastor, you see, what do you think about this? You know, uh, single blessedness. Huh? Uh -huh. What single blessedness? You know, they say, you know, if you are single, you can do better than the, the marriage one. I say, huh? Who said, who said that? Oh, what advantage? Oh, we are going to learn that next week. Okay. Be content. Now, if you are married, okay, if you are if you're married, seek to stay married. Amen? If you are no longer under bondage, then seek to remain free. So when a person trusts Christ as their Savior, there is an, there is 
a change, okay? There is a change in the heart of that person. Again, a person who got saved, there is always a change in that heart's person. He becomes a new person in Christ. Simple ways are to be abandoned. Being saved, however, does not require that there has to be a drastic change in the areas of your life. You don't need to quit your job because you are working. You know, Pastor, I'm working. Eh? So maybe I need to quit because I got saved. No! Unless you are required to do something sinful or dishonoring Christ, then leave. Are you with me? You don't, you don't have to move to another house. No, if your spouse is not saved, <laughs> salvation does not require you to dump your spouse. If you are, in our text, they talk about circumcision. If you are circumcised, Paul says you are not required to reverse it. No, if you are a slave, don't worry and fret about it, but go ahead and be the best servant you can be. That's the instruction. No, if you get the chance to be free, however, then pursue it. There is nothing wrong in bettering yourself, but it is not required. Okay, it's not required. So this admonition is illustrated in verses 18 to 24. Every believer should abide in the same calling or vocation or invitation he was in when the Lord saved him. So when Christ, when the Lord saved you, so if is his calling to you is to get married, then get married. And if his calling to you is to remain like single, then be, be a single. Here, Jewish believers... Okay, most of course Jewish are circumcised, should not seek to become Gentiles, uncircumcised when they get saved. No, neither should Gentiles seek to become Jews after salvation. That's what it says in verses 18 to 19. Take note, don't try to change the condition you are in. Okay, in order to get saved or stay saved. Sometimes, you know, this is also happening among people. You know, you know, I, I will gonna change that person. If we get married, we're gonna change him. Oh you wish. <laughs> the issue is whether or not you are keeping the commandments of God. That's the issue. There are no New Testament commandments regarding circumcision. Whether there is no commandment of God, there is no need to be concerned. Think about it. If you find yourself Okay, if you find yourself a slave or a servant, don't worry about getting free. Don't fret. The Bible said, don't fret. Use your servitude as a testimony for the Lord. You know, especially if you are working in the house, use this as a testimony. A Christian is bought with a price, the Bible says. He is God's servant. So as God's servant, he is to serve the Lord in whatever situation he finds himself. When the slave gets saved, he is not to worry about being the slave of another man because he is the Lord's free man. So therefore, he should use the fact that he or she is a slave as an opportunity to be witness for the Lord as his free man. In, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, the Bible said, Let as many servants, because during at that time, servants are very common, you know. So let as many servants as are under the yoke, count their own master, worthy of all honor. That the name of God, so that's the purpose, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Because those servants who God saved, and then if they don't behave accordingly, then the name of God will be blasphemed. So that's why we have to behave ourselves. And, he, and they that have believing masters, so those masters who are believers, let them not despise them because they are brethren, so you know, these are your brethren, but rather do the same, do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Also, same thing in Ephesians chapter six, verses five to eight. Servants, be obedient to them that are your master. Take note: if you study this verse in the book of Ephesians, beginning chapter number five, actually, all the way to chapter number six. There is one important thing that we have to understand and to take note of this. You know what? Chapter number five, it talks about husband, love your wife. Oh, how can I love my wife? You know, so nagging wife, you know, very difficult. 
<laughs> and then, oh, wife, submit to your husband. Oh, how can I submit to that husband? So lazy. No. Children, obey your parents in the room. How can I obey your parents? You know, they are so, they neglected us. And then we have servant obedient to them. You know, in order for these things to become possible, you know, there is, there is also one way that all these things become possible. You can find that in verse number 18 of Ephesians chapter number 5. When it says, if you want that all these things become possible, say, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be not drunk with wine, but we're in excess, I say, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And did you notice all of this, the following verses until chapter number 6, all these things become possible if you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Because if you do it in your own flesh, maybe you can for a season, <laughs> maybe 30 days, and then it's over. I'm tired. I cannot continue. But if it is with the help of the Holy Spirit, I tell you, it's a long-lasting commitment. Amen? Again, like I said, marriage. Yeah, sometimes we suffer. There are difficulties, but always remember, marriage is what? Ministry. Amen? Which means we minister to the needs of our spouse. So for the wife is to be loved, and for the husband uh, is to be obeyed. So which means the wife obey their husband, and husband love your wife. Children, obey your parents. Amen? Servant, be obedient to them that your master. You see? So there are clear instructions how we live as Christian, my beloved brethren. So don't say, don't tell us that, oh, I don't know it. So which means when we understand all these things, then we will become contented of what we are. In fact, contentment is not, uh, what do you call that? Uh, what is the right word? Natural. Yeah. Contentment is not natural. Why? Even the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul said, I learned to be content. So which means contentment is something that we learn. Yeah. I learned how to be a base and how to be a bind. That's what Paul said. And that's the good news, my beloved brethren. Because of the word of God, we learn how to be content. Amen? So Christian, live in the word, but they are not of it. Amen? Looking forward to a future citizenship in heaven, our responsibility is to accept and be content in walking with God, whatever our situation might be, and living for Him. Remember, my beloved brethren, serve the Lord in the position that God has placed you and share the gospel with folks who might not otherwise hear it. Amen? That is our position, and that is the mandate that's been given to every Christian like you and me. Preach the word. Amen? So, the command for marriage, believer, reconcile, remain unmarried. To counts, I mean, number two, the counsel for mixed marriages, be a good testimony to your spouse and to your children. Amen? And, of course, for the believers, we are admonished to be content. Amen? To be content. So, as we close, amen? Divorce rates are astronomical in the world today. You know, I'm a marriage license solemnizer. And uh, from time to time, you know, uh, uh, ROM always send us those uh, statistics. Statistics of, uh, about the divorce rate here in Singapore. You know, it's really, really sad seeing that uh, there are many divorces happen, especially during the circuit breaker. 
You know, some people think, oh, now it's time for them to be reunited. Actually, they don't want. <laughs> you know, you just like a cat and a dog, you put them together in the cage. <laughs> That's how behave those husband and wife. And there are many of them lining up, filing divorce. So anyway, that's what happened. So that's why I said those wanted to get married and they approached me. I say, oh, too close. One month too close. Most of the time I don't accept it. Because I want to, this marriage, I mean this couple have to go with uh, marriage counseling first. So again, like I said, half of the marriages made currently will end in divorce within a few years of the wedding day. In fact, sometimes they they spend hundreds of thousands with their marriage, you know? And then because they do not want it to continue, then they spend another hundreds of thousands. Imagine. Wasted money, isn't it? So it's like it is likely your family has been touched by divorce in some way, maybe. No, few have not been, but you know, much of this tragedy could be avoided if there were more understanding and acceptance of the Bible teaching about marriage. So God expect marriage to be a lifelong contract between a man and a woman. Amen? I repeat, man and woman, huh? not Adam and Steve. So yes. <laughs> There are scriptural reasons for divorce, but this should only be considered as a last option. So believers should seek other believers as life mates. And both should seek a place of service in a scriptural church. That's why this is what I'm saying. Get right with God and get right before the church. So both of them should serve the Lord. The family should be dedicated and devoted to the service of the Lord. Even their children, included their children, influence your children in serving the Lord. That like, you know, sometimes we have this experience in the Philippines. The parents say, okay, oh, go, son, son. Now it's Sunday school. You go now. You go now. No, you, you're, uh, I think your Sunday school teacher is there though, to fetch you. So you just go and join. Then the, maybe the son said, then how about you? Oh, later I will come. But they, did, they didn't go to church. You know, what kind of testimony are we giving to them? So again, my beloved brethren, both partners should pray for each other and pray together for their family. Amen? They should do their best to bring their children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. There will be rough patches in any relationship. Yes, there is, will be rough patches, but the mindset of the children of God should be that way will weather the storms and continue in the service of the Lord. Believers can resolve their differences if they truly desire to do so. Yes. Selfishness, take note of this, and pettiness will quickly lead to tragedy. Did you know that? Selfishness and pettiness will quickly lead to a tragedy in any relationship. So consider your choice of a lifetime mate. So before you get married and do not say, uh, do not say I do, unless you truly intend to keep the promise you make. That's why, remember the last time that I preached, keep your marriage vow. Because that vow is not only given to those, I mean, it's not just witnessed by those people uh, uh, attended your wedding. You, that vow is not only given to your partner, but that vow is given to the Lord. You bow in the presence of God. And God will require you to pay that vow till death do us part. Amen? That's all. Amen? So, God, uh, may I ask the pianist to come and play the invitation song?